So um, probably most of you will know me. I'm Hannes Reinecke and I'm well doing assorted things related to storage. <clears throat> As you might or might not be aware, I had a talk last year about TLS encryption for NVMe. So um, just a short wrap up of what, what this is about. So the um, NVMe has nowadays um, inherited the capability to talk via TCP. So we can now attach storage via, via TCP, much like iSCSI, only a bit faster. However, in doing so, we will be sending packets un unencrypted over the wire. And security folks repeatedly tell me that this is not a good thing and really things should be encrypted. So there was a proposal and an accepted proposal to use TLS encryption for NVMe. Which is, yeah, I mean, that's what one would have thought. Yeah, right, of course. I mean, if you need uh, encrypted data, use TLS. Okay, fine. However, we are talking about kernel site TLS here. So um, we need to encrypt data from the kernel via TLS and then send it over the wire. To add a bit more complexity here, we cannot use this standard trick of um, starting the connection in user space and then uh, pass the existing socket to the kernel such that the kernel um, shall then do the encryption. That is how the current in-kernel TLS encryption works because surprise, surprise, the kernel has a TLS encryption, but this is just the pure encryption. This is not the TLS handshake leading up to um, the agreement of the so-called IVs, initialization vectors, which you need to encode the data itself. So the kernel design is that you pass in IVs and then the kernel will do the encryption. How you get the IVs is, well, not something the kernel is concerned with. So, meaning um, the current design of the in-kernel TLS is that you start the TLS negotiation in user space via normal um, by the normal methods, normal libraries like um, OpenSSL or GNU TLS, who is surprise, surprise, even have a mechanism of talk of passing this IV to the kernel. And then this IV will be passed into the kernel and the kernel can do the encryption. Fine. However, as indicated, it doesn't really work for NVMe. Due to a brilliant design quirk, they invented a mechanism where you can start the connection and then after exchanging parameters you can upgrade it or you should upgrade it to TLS. So you're running off an existing connection which then needs to be upgraded to TLS which completely defeats the idea of sending so of passing existing sockets into the kernel because you can't do it because you have to do the initial NVMe negotiation in, already in kernel and then use the existing kernel from the socket, from, um, yeah, ex, use the existing socket from the kernel. So, okay, meaning we have to pass the socket and existing kernel socket to user space. And now we're coming back to last year's talk. That was the, the presentation I did last year. Namely, all right, what can we do to, to develop something which will handle it? So um, the problem is that, A, we don't have a good method of passing file descriptors to user space, and B, we don't have a good method of calling programs from the kernel. Now, everyone will possibly tell, well, wait, there is call user mode helper. Yes, there is call user mode helper. And it really deserves to be removed or actually shot directly because that's horrible. Call user mode helper is essentially the kernel doing, doing an exec VE on a path name. So whatever is at that path name will be in that namespace, mind you, will be executed. Could be literally anything. And this then has to do, well, in our case, is security sensitive operation, namely doing the TLS handshake and pass the results back to the kernel. What could possibly go wrong? 
And also the added quirk is that called user mode helper doesn't exec VE. So it has to start that program which more often than not means that you have to load the program from, from the file system, which normally is not a problem, but you need to do this to establish the, the connection. And as this is a, a block device, if you're particularly unlucky, you need to do it to establish the connection to serve your root partition. So there might be a chance that you're not even able to load that program from disk. The normal way of circumventing this, what we do for iSCSI and multipathing, is calling mlock. Load the program, call mlock, and then the program dies in memory, which is okay for demons, but doesn't work for call user mode helper, which insists on starting programs. So, call user mode helper is out of the game, meaning we still don't have a good way of calling programs. Hmm. So, what to do now? And this is my idea now. Now we're coming to this year's talk. So the idea is, what if we could prepare a distinct virtual file system, basically something like an inner ID, but in a different namespace, which would contain that program, which or daemon in this case, which executes things on behalf of that kernel. Then we could pre-populate, well, we have to pre-populate that image RD, that special image RD, and we can actually concat or load it together with the actual kernel. So the kernel can do some measurements on that image RD. We can even sign it together with the kernel. So the kernel can do a proper um, root of trust evaluation to figure out whether this is the correct thing he really wants to execute or run on. And um, I brought up this idea last week at the Alps conference, and it turns out that it was actually, well, not too bad an idea. Plus, um, apparently there's something called um, user mode drivers, which essentially is a small stop into which you pack a program, which then can be executed, which is, similar what I want to do, but really I need, I, I would prefer having a real file system because that makes life easier. And we can also store additional things like configuration files or some configuration data on that file system. And um, a whole things will, uh, the whole thing will be a bit more streamlined. Um, the other idea I had, and this is now why I wanted to talk to Jörg, um, is to whether we could utilize secure enclaves, like what he discussed last uh, yesterday for um, AMD and now what we just heard previously for ARM, which is um, where you have processor extensions which allows you to run encrypted partitions essentially. Um, but I'm not sure whether that is even feasible because that would mean we would have to start, start a hypervisor and it also would mean so that um, well, we always will have to have a hypervisor in the system, which is not something which you can rely on. Um, so, meaning the first proposal would be to indeed create um, or update the init ID mechanism to have more than one init ID and each of these init IDs running in a different file system um, namespace. I think this should be not that hard. Um, currently, init ID is just a single namespace, but I think we can easily extend it to a second, um, to, to have more than one namespace, or rather attaching distinct name, namespace to each init ID, something like. Um, so the question would be if someone here in the audience already already had experience with these user mode user mode block drivers or user mode drivers. Apparently they are already in the kernel, but on some for some odd architectures. And also um, whether this idea of having the secondary init ID is um, something we should or I should go 
with and pursue in this context. Um, then, right, okay. Yeah, so if I understand right your idea, you are essentially suggesting to have basically separate file system route, yeah? So, uh, so yes. something like that you could change route, well, that was the no, old no, you don't, no, the thing is, no, you don't have to do a change route. That's a, that's a beauty. You will have an inner ID, meaning a tar file, which will mm -hmm. then be a, come, becoming yeah. a RAMFS. Pretending a file system, yeah. <laughs> Pretending to be a file system, running off its own file system na uh, namespace. Mm -hmm. So that the only one able to access it really is the kernel, because the other, others won't be able to find it even. OK, yeah, so you want to have like a private file system for yes. your helper, basically. Yes. So that basically to protect it from, from basically you, like user space, basically. Because like the kernel itself will always be able to access it. Yeah. Of course. Like yeah, other sure. parts, other parts. But that was, to... that was the idea, right? I mean, yes, we need it. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on behalf of the kernel. Yeah, but other parts of the user space will not be able to see it. OK. Yeah, but you could do similar stuff with like arbitrary TMPFS basically mounting it in a private namespace. Yeah. That would be similar. Yeah, sure. Of course, you could do that. Um, but then the the nice thing with that approach, I thought, was that you'll be able to even um, do a checksum or rather a signature on it. You could, you could even attach a, a, signature, a signature to it when packing it with a kernel. So you would be able to validate this and you would, ex you would be able to extend the root of trust to that one too. I see. That was the, basically the, the idea. So whether that is, makes sense at all, I'm, I'm not a security expert. I think it might be a good idea, but then who knows. But yeah, sure. I mean, uh, you could just easily have any other file system in any other means to do these kind of things. Um, so, um, because the thing is that we really need to have it in user space because we need to use the user space libraries to which you know TLS or OpenSSL. Because this is, I mean, TLS handshake, and that is one of the most complex things of the entire of the entire TLS stack with lots and lots and lots of compatibility going to, you'd have to contend with. So developing something in kernel is prohibit prohibitively expensive. And also, you um, will be having a hard time getting this to be validated that the implement implementation you did is actually feasible. There is a company, um, oh, I forgot the name, um, uh, Chuck Lever had been talking to them, so actually have a um, an in-kernel server-side implementation based on the embed TLS stuff. But then again, I mean, this is in kernel, and I'm I can't really see this going to go anywhere because that will be just horrible, horrible. Meaning, so we have to use existing libraries, which means we have to have a, a user space program, and then we have to do the user space program use, using these libraries, and at the same time, having to have some sort of protection that this is really the program we want to talk to, because if you attack that one, you'll have an instinct instantaneous root access to your root device. Not really what you want. It. So, and um, I, meanwhile, I've also played around with doing a prototype implementation because um, the other problem, as I indicated, is of the stuff going on why I may even if we use and can be done via IMA yeah, possibly. No, you. No, no, no. That was no hang on. So, um, so in, in David said that you that CPO doesn't support extend attributes. Yes, correct. Um. But um, I wasn't actually think uh, talking about uh, validating the unpacked one. I was talking about validating the packed one. Because that's a CPO archive, which will be sipped, uh, which will be sipped and added to the kernel. And my idea was to um, and to encrypt or rather validate the uh, the zip version, 
when it's being parked to uh, and added to the kernel because that can can be done and needs to be done during kernel build times at which point you even you do have access to the actual key for generating signatures and all so um you will be doing the validation before unpacking and then it simply doesn't matter what the file system does because well you don't need to validate the file system anymore so that was the idea right so coming back to the other thing how this program would need to look like um at the end of the day it turns out that you really have to have a daemon because you have several processes to, uh, contending with and what's more you need to have something which you actually can m log to avoid any well paging issues there so you need to have a daemon q1 could umh be replaced with something like the automon daemon um parallel entry system normal and then, then uh, pivot root put i i so hate pivot root pivot root is horrible and an abomination and in the end it's exactly the same if you do a pivot root you change your main root point uh, if you change your root point from one file system namespace to another file system namespace so actually it's the same than having starting off with two file system namespaces so doesn't really doesn't really change much and um yes you could be putting it in drake i mean in the unit id itself but then it's always tricking tricky having programs continue to run off the init id even though the main root file even though you have changed into the actual root file system uh, because i'm not sure how far and how well systemd handles um file system namespaces if you start a daemon from the inner rd that daemon will be also be under systemd control clearly then you switch over to the main root file system and systemd will be switched over to that's this ominous reexec stuff systemd does but it also means that it remains to control that daemon which still still runs off the dracid in it ready. meaning it will be running off a different root file system than systemd itself which has some interesting implications like what actually happens if you do restart of that program it will be restarted within which context hmm. maybe someone that's possibly a, a, a question to andreas schwab he should be able to tell um but i certainly can't i think it's if you do restart then the demon should be restarted in the current root file system and not the original one i don't know maybe it's the original one i don't so um there are some complexities which i simply don't want to imagine and can't imagine because i don't know what will happen um right back to the a demon question so so we have a demon which then acts on behalf of the kernel so the kernel needs to instruct that demon to do something the origin design was done by Chuck Lever, who used a an accept based method, because the underlying problem is that you have to pass existing sockets from the kernel to user space. There is no interface allowing you to do so. The one possible option um, Chuck did was using accept and then add this socket to the accept call such that any users by Steven could just call accept on a random on a special um, character device and then he would be getting the open sockets via the uh, as a response to the accept call which was neat but then arguably a hack and um and Jacob Kaczynski didn't really like that so that's out of the game and jacob strongly suggests well why don't you use netlink so the idea here is to use netlink 
and taking advantage of the one existing methods we have for passing file descriptors, and that's the um, pass cred, uh, passing credentials mechanisms we have for Unix sockets. That is basically what SysMT is using already. Um, there is a method um, to pass file descriptors from one process to another using the SO pass cred socket option. And then you'll be able to send sockets, uh, send file descriptors over. However, this is strictly res uh, this is restricted to Unix sockets, meaning process to process, and um, can't uh, and you can't use it for Netlink, which is process uh, kernel to pr process to kernel or kernel to process communication. So you would need to adapt this or rather port it over to Netlink to do so. And, but if you do that, then you have the very interesting problem that the process doesn't have a chance to reject the message. Um, because out of necessity, when the message is being received by the process, the file descriptor already has to be in the table of that process. Otherwise, the process will evaluate the message and try to open a file, a file descriptor with, with a given number, and that isn't present, so it won't work. Hence, it needs to be there before the process evaluates that, comma, that, uh, that message. But it has to be there before the message will evaluate it. It even is there if the message is evaluated and the process decides, oh no, I don't want to handle it, and does a reject. It will still be in the uh, in the um, file descriptor table of the process. So with that, we have an easy way of doing a file descriptor table overflow because well, the process has no chance of avoiding that. So we need to be a bit more careful here in coding, and that is uh, the prime reason why I want to have that daemon under kernel control because it's really easy to crash it if it's not in properly coded or if this message isn't properly handled. So, and that is the overall idea here to then do a netlink based socket, a uh, netlink based message, which will allow the daemon to um, receive the file descriptor, do the TLS handshake on that socket, and then pass the generated IV via the existing mechanism into the kernel to use for the TLS encryption. So um, the latter part is has already been implemented. So I mean, the, that's what I did with the original accept prototype. So the missing building block is just using the, the Netlink socket. However, given this problem um, I, with the file descriptors and there that you have to insert the file descriptors into the process table and table before the message can be parsed um, makes me sli ever so slightly unhappy and I'd re rather would have a different method for that but then I wasn't able to think of one. So if anyone has a different idea how we could parse a file descriptor from kernel to user space I'd be very happy if he would speak up. But this is then more the realm of um, networking. So I'm not sure if people are aware of the complexities here. Right. Okay. So, and then the hope is that we can do it. Oh, yes. And incidentally, I will be leveraging the kernel keyring for holding the keys of the um, for TLS, because the current um, prescribed method is using pre-shared keys for TLS, not X509 certificates. And well, we need to store the keys somewhere. So um, I will be leveraging the kernel keyring to do that. Um, currently, this is a pure software thing living somewhere in the kernel, which also makes me slightly unhappy because it means, yeah, there is, well, the kernel keyring is just a piece of software living in the kernel. 
is there a possibility to leverage hardware here for holding the kernel keyring, like any AMD extension, which would help me here? So, uh, Jörg? Or even Andreas, maybe, for ARM? Yeah, Andreas is on listen only, so he can't tell me. Too bad. All right. So. Yeah, so maybe yes. let me try to recapitulate so that I can wrap my head yeah. around it. So, yeah. so you want to, to have like a separate init RD, and the kernel will start from this separate init RD, this trusted daemon, which will. No, 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 no. no. Um, or, the kernel, so what will happen during boot is that the kernel will unpack the entity, the ragged entity as normal, and also unpack the other entity. And then the yeah. boot process will start as normal, but at one point, it will the kernel will additionally start that daemon of that separate entity, but this will then just continue to run, um, well, more or less independent, asynchronous with the kernel. But that's really it. The boot process won't change at all. I agree. I understand. So, so basically, currently, as we start the init process, uh, it will also start sometime later yes. another yes. process, which will be yes. this trusted, yes. trusted daemon. Okay. And now it needs to pass a socket to this trusted daemon, essentially. Yes. Yes. And it will need to do this repeatedly, as far as I understand, basically for each and yeah, yeah, for each connection. connection. So for, yeah. yeah. I see. Okay. So that's that's the reason why you need to pass some kind of message telling you, hey, here, here is a new connection and here you have a socket for it. Okay. I see. Yeah, so actually we we do handle, for example, the exactly same thing for the like FS notify infrastructure or in particular for the FA notify thing, because when you get the like event for FA notify, you pass a file descriptor with it and basically you install the file descriptor in the process table. Yeah? Now, the process has to, like, the process first has asked to receive these events, so the process sure. knows it's going to receive sure. some descriptors. So, so that's the way how we do it. And in principle, for kernel, it's trivial to install whatever file descriptor in the process table, yeah? and it just has to somehow pass the descriptor number because exactly you just have to tell the the process how oh, it's no use. Number but seventeen or something, yeah. In principle, there is never a way for a process to basically tell no yeah it has once it has exactly. subscribed to receiving these events so like i wouldn't be that much concerned that the process cannot say no simply you know the process just has to be correctly handling the messages to learn about the new file descriptor and then either close it if it's not interested mm -hmm. or you know mm -hmm. or we can find out okay there is no place no space in the file descriptor table so Basically, we say there is no way to handle this connection, you know, bad luck. Mm. We, we cannot connect to the user daemon. So, so we all, already handle these situations in the mm -hmm. FS Notify framework, and there is it's rather trivial code, I would say. Okay. Uh, but FS Notify does it via IO controls, right? Uh, it does it via a special file descriptor. So basically, you call a syscall, it will return you a file descriptor which describes this instance of oh, the notification. All right. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah. yeah well. And then by operations on these file descriptors, by, by calling like special syscalls on these file descriptors, mm -hmm. you can like set up what you want to watch. And by reading from the descriptor, you are receiving the events, and the receipt of the event will actually install a file descriptor for you mm -hmm. in your in your file table. So so that's how it works for FS Notify. Yeah. Uh, yeah. For this case, like since the process is almost completely under your control, yeah, you could even I can imagine you could even like on start pass it some file descriptor like this, like even Unix pipe file descriptor, and then you can pop by Pass the other yeah, but this will, will only work for the during startup, right? I mean, and I can't pass it and pass file descriptors later on. Uh, the file descriptors won't be known by the time the process starts up. Yes, yeah, so, so you, you you will just pass one Unix pipe mm -hmm. on startup, mm -hmm. and then the pro the, the your trusted daemon will read from this Unix pipe to learn about the other file descriptors. Ah, that would be an alternative. Just uh, basically, just uh, establish a pipe, and then he reads yeah. the file descriptor of, of the pipe. 
yeah that would be an easy um, way that that oh. should be rather easy for the kernel it's a question how, how difficult would it be on the kernel side to actually put the file descriptor in the pipe because that's actually pretty involved code as far as i remember really so okay yeah I'm, I'm gonna take well you are not passing that, not that writing netting messages anymore involved right so <laughs> yeah 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 I, but you know right you know i guess jacob kicinski is right in the sense that you know we i don't think we have any precedence for, for establishing unix pipe between the kernel and the user space so i'm yep. not sure actually how easy is it to generate messages into unix pipe from the kernel like not that it would be impossible but maybe the infrastructure just isn't there yeah on the other hand we have all the file handle passing code there so that's that's the simpler stuff mm -hmm. Yeah, and no. that was just one alternative I, I had in mind. Yeah, because otherwise, if you if you would like to pass a file descriptor with netlink, you would essentially have to implement the stuff like installing the file descriptor in the table, which is trivial. But then you have to somehow take care, like you have to decide when you install this file descriptor and and stuff like this. You know, make sure that the message doesn't get lost before the process receives it and stuff like this so yeah precisely i know i know that's the way yes um i've seen it i mean i had to look at the unix code uh, at the code in the unix socket what this does and um the actual install uh, the installing the file descriptor in the process table is quite easy but getting there and, and and all the accounting you need to do around it to ensure right how many did i have and do i overflow the file descriptor what do i do if the message getting lost and heaven forbid if that happens to be a multicast message, oh, what do I do then? Um, so um, lots, yeah. of, lots and lots of co complexities around that, which, um, well, I'm not really comfortable doing so. So um, the pipe one, the idea of the pipe is not a bad one. Yeah. I'll be having a look there to see whether this, we could do it because that clearly would be the easiest way. Just open yeah. the pipe and just have, have a process which reads off a pipe, which is being filled from the kernel side. Done. So yeah. that would be cool. Yeah, right. Um, and the other thing is then how this all works with network namespaces. But uh, yeah, Ugh. um, yeah, I probably will defer this for later because this is also not a fun topic. <sighs> Good. All right, cool. That was very helpful. I must say. Um, good, right. Um, that was no, no. That was ah, oh, yeah. Put it the wrong, wrong here. Yeah, yeah. I know, I know. So no, um, I'm more or less done now. So um, the other one is that, uh, as indicated, that I'll be using the kernel keyring, and so maybe we should look. Or it would be an idea to look at the keyring whether we could use some hardware mechanisms to protect the key and keyring itself, because that's where all the while well, critical data is being stored. Um, but then this is possibly a different topic and also something very specific, which I'm not sure um, is of general use here because I'm not sure if anyone here in this audience ever worked with a kernel keyring. David possibly has, but I'm not even sure that. All right. Um, good. So, if you have any more questions, I I, I David, is still, David is still, still, typing, is still trying to type something, but it seems yeah. to be a long way coming. Either a very long message, or he's not sure what to type. Oh, yes. Oh, there it is. Right. Uh, well. mm -hmm. You block style approach for current user. on io using okay oh, okay yeah um the user rpc mm, yeah oh ah, the u block uh, you mean the the new u block thing they did all oh, right no that's a different story that's the and um, that's the user mode driver for the for um target mode type so um that is just doing I you are correct. This is just doing IOU ring and just using IOU ring to um basically emulate a device. So as I said, more like a target mode implementation. 
and um, doesn't really help much here because um, you will have to have a you will the IOU is being set up up front, and then um, IU rig more or less is an add-on to existing kernel interfaces. And, well, in other kernels and highly hyped multiple multiplexing thing, but still it's using the um, existing kernel interface, so it doesn't really add any new mechanisms which I could use sadly. Um, need a pit NS? Yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, I possibly need tons and tons of namespaces, of course, yes. Um, I not only need an amount namespace, um, pit namespace, I probably would need two, but, and I also would need a network namespace if I go for the um, netlink approach, because that would need to be protected via, ne via um, namespaces too. So, yes, I possibly need thousands of them as usual you always need all of them uh, but then i'll probably ask christian browner here if he can help out he should be knowing how to handle this stuff but yeah that's a good point right any more questions right doesn't seem to be the case so thank you all for listening Okay, 